to the We Have a Destiny broadcast. Our prayer is that your life will be changed forever through hearing the Word of God. Embassies of Christ services are every Sunday at 9 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. Every Tuesday at 10 a.m., come and have your faith built at Faith and Healing. You can also join us Wednesdays at 7 p.m. for our midweek service. If you are ever in the area, feel free to stop by Embassies of Christ located at 4285 Cleveland Street, Gary, Indiana. Thank you for tuning in. Now let's prepare to hear a word from the Lord. big smile on your face come on squeeze it out a big smile now squeeze it out now don't make me do it don't make me do it because you know I'll do it all right if the person next to you is not smiling stand up and point at them right now look at her <laughs> all right now with your beautiful smile turn to the person on either side of you say good afternoon I'm so glad you're here I love you with the love of the Lord Praise God. That's good. A merry heart does good like a medicine. 
Praise God. Well, I'm going to enter into agreement with your prayers now. Father, I just thank you so much for another opportunity to hear your word. When we hear your word and put it into practice in our life, our lives get better. That'll be our testimony for this word today. Our lives are better. Father, I thank you that this word will go forth with power, anointing, clarity, and understanding. Thank you for deliverance, salvation, healing, miracles, increase, and breakthroughs that shall be the fruit from this message today. Satan, you are defeated. We command you to cancel every plan, every scheme, and every assignment against this message in the name of Jesus. And Holy Spirit, we welcome your presence. Minister and touch every heart by this word today, Holy Spirit. And word my mouth, Holy Spirit. Let me clearly, let me accurately communicate God's heart and impart his word into our lives today. Our confession of faith for this message is that our hearts are good soil. Your word, Father, is great seed. Let this word bring increase, not only to our lives personally, but to our families, this church, this city, this region. And as this message goes all over the world, over our television broadcasts and over the internet, let everyone that hears this word receive increase from you, Father God. As this word is heard, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in our lives on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a big clap offering of praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. We've, uh, we've been, been teaching the Word of God. Uh, the series has been uh, entitled Over the Top Faith. But it really is a powerful faith message that God is bringing to this church and to the members of this church and those guests that attend because I believe God is preparing us for the days ahead. And uh, our theme scripture has been 1 John 5 and 4. And uh, 1 John 5 and 4 the word says, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. God has created us and expects us to live an overcoming life on the earth. We are not to live our lives on this earth. Once we get born again, we are not to live our lives defeated. We are not to live our lives uh, as victims of, of the devil. Jesus came to give us power to be overcomers in the world. Amen? And that's his heart's desire for every believer. And Christians have to get back to this, this plan and this purpose that God has for our life and our experience here while we're on the earth. And I believe with all my heart that the, the reason I've been teaching this message and the reason God has, has led me to teach this message is because the days that we are living in, the enemy's attacks against the church and against mankind in general have increased. They have become more intense. And uh, they have become more frequent. Uh, where you, you would normally go through a test or a trial and, and uh, maybe have, you know, a, a season to get yourself, you know, gathered back together again. Well, it seems like you'll go out of one attack and you'll enter into another attack. And it's not unusual uh, for us to, un to experience challenges and problems in life. John 16.33, John 16.33, Jesus says something very interesting. He said these words. He says, uh, uh, he says, I told you these things so that in me you might have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. King James Version says you'll suffer persecution. In this world, you will have trouble. But then Jesus says these words. He says, but take heart. I've overcome the world. So what is he saying? He said, don't, don't think it's strange or don't think it unusual uh, that you go through problems and challenges. He's saying that's normal. He says, but here's the good news. When you go through those things, always remember that I've overcome the world. 
Now, that's good news for us because if you're saved and if you're born again, where does Christ live now? In me. And in fact, over in the first chapter of John, uh, first chapter, uh, fourth chapter of 1 John, most Christians know the scripture, because Jesus lives in you now, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Now, that's powerful because what that scripture teaches us is it does not matter what the world may bring Jesus lives in me and he's greater than anything that I will face in the world amen and so today we're gonna go a little bit deeper in in uh, in over over the top faith um, I want you to turn uh, in Mark chapter 4 verse 35 Mark chapter 4 verse 35 and uh, we're gonna head into some deep water here today can you handle it all right. Mark 4 and 35, it says, uh, That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, he referring to Jesus, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. And there were also other boats with him. And a furious squall or a big storm came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, and the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet or peace, be still. And then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Now, this is a perfect example of the point I've been making here this uh, afternoon. Jesus gets in a boat with his disciples and uh, makes a decision to go over to the other side of the lake. Uh, obviously, the Holy Spirit is leading him to go over to the other side of the lake and to minister to the people. And so Jesus gets in the boat. And uh, we know what he did when he got in the boat. He went to the back and, and took a nap. As the boat is headed over to the other side, all of a sudden, a storm pops up. And, you know, if you aren't spiritual, you would assume that this storm, you know, just happened because all of the right weather conditions came together right at that moment and it just starts storming and raining and wind blowing and all of that. But I'm here to tell you, that storm came from the devil. That storm came from the devil. Are you hearing me? It was not natural conditions that caused that storm. It was the devil that caused that storm. So now what happened when the storm came up? You know, it was pretty severe because we know it really bad because the boat was getting filled with water and starting to sink. That's a serious storm, right? But what is Jesus doing in the storm? Sleeping. Sleeping. What are the disciples doing? In a state of panic. They are in such a state of panic, they have already in their mind given up on surviving. We know they gave up because they ran to Jesus and woke him up. And instead of waking him, waking him up and saying, we know that you can, you can fix this, they woke him up and said, don't you care that we're going to drown here? They had given up. They had given up because they had been attacked by the devil. They gave up. Jesus wakes up, and Jesus doesn't give up. Jesus wakes up experiencing the same conditions that his disciples are going through, but has a totally different response. Jesus is not panicking, and Jesus has no plans of dying. Jesus gets up with a firm faith decision that he's going to live and that he has authority over anything the devil brings. Jesus gets up in faith knowing that if the devil brings something, he doesn't have to accept it. Jesus gets up 
And he has, is just as aggressive against Satan as Satan is against him. In fact, he confronts the attack of Satan head on. <laughs> Stands up in the boat, looks at the waves and the wind, and says, shut up! Stop! Peace! Be still. He's just as aggressive as the devil is. He didn't get up and say, I hope this blows over. Let me tell you something about the attacks of the devil. The attacks of the devil don't just blow over. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm, I want to uh, set this, uh, establish this for you right away. I'm, this message is not to glorify Satan. The purpose of this message is to, is to make you more aware of your opponent. Because if you don't know the strategies of your opponent, you can't defeat him. Now, one of the things you got to know about the devil is he's very confrontational. Very. What do I mean by that? He has no problem getting up in your face, spewing all kind of garbage and talking all kind of trash and bringing all kind of, kinds of challenges your way. He's not bashful. And uh, he's very, very aggressive. The question is, given his nature, you as a believer, what is your response going to be when he shows up? I taught on these points in faith and healing this past Tuesday, and the Lord said you got to bring it uh, to the body on Sunday morning. It's a little, little bit different. But um, essentially, the, the message is the same. See, we, we are people of faith, and we know the faith scriptures. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. I don't believe you heard me. Not seen. We know the scripture. You know, NIV says, faith being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. We know the faith scriptures. And we quote the scripture, you know, if I have faith in this, have faith in God, I can say to the mountain, be moved, be cast in the sea. If I don't doubt in my heart, but believe those things I say will happen, they'll be done for me. So we know the scriptures, we know the scriptures. But really, faith is one of the most confrontational gifts that God has given us. It's confrontational. It is not weak and passive it's very strong and it's very aggressive faith is see we quote those scriptures and they sound nice but the reason god has given us faith and every christian has faith according to romans chapter 12 verse 3 says god has given to every each one of us the measure of faith the reason god gave us the gift of faith is for really two objectives to be fulfilled through your faith you can bring the promises of God from heaven to your life. That's one of the purposes of your faith, to bring the promises of God from heaven to your life. That means the supernatural power of God can flow to your life. The other purpose of faith is for, through your faith, to drive out and get rid of things that are in your life that don't line up with God's word for you. Your faith is given to you for those two purposes to bring heaven to you and to get hell out of you. That's why you have faith. Now, if those are the objectives of faith, then it teaches us that faith is not weak. I'll put it another way. It teaches us that, we, that faith is not passive. It teaches us that faith has to be aggressive and faith has to be strong and faith has to be violent in order to get out of the way anything standing between you and the promise of God and to uproot things out of your life that don't belong in it. See, sickness does not belong in your life. Sickness does not belong in your body. How can you say that? Because we have word. And the word of God says by the stripes of Jesus we were healed. 
And then we look at the life of Jesus, and for three and a half years, he goes around doing what? Healing sick folks. Healing them, which teaches us the will of God for you to be well and to be healed. But I'm here to tell you, if sickness is not supposed to be in my body, when the enemy tries to attack my body with sickness, I better have an aggressive attitude of faith to get it out of my life. Because if I don't deal with it, it won't leave. The wind kept blowing against that boat until Jesus confronted it. And you will keep dealing with the stuff that devil brings in your life until you confront it. You got to go head to head, face to face, toe to toe in order to get that stuff out. So faith is violent. <laughs> faith is violent and then you know I, I said I think I mentioned this last week or a week before the church has become passive I'm tell you church ain't strong like it used to be I, I, I grew up old school Pentecostal that's how I grew up I got saved in an old school Pentecostal church. They call it Sanctified Church. And they were, they were hardcore. They didn't play. I mean, uh, I, I call them, they had these devil bloodhounds. <laughs> them old church mothers. And see, and, and most of the buildings were real small. So as soon as you walked in the door, the bloodhounds would turn. Because everybody close to the door anyway. And they'd turn and they'd look at you. And if you didn't look right, I mean, you better fake holy if you wasn't. If you did not look right, they, they, those spiritual bloodhounds would pounce on you. they say, come follow me. And they'd take you to that altar. And they would all gather around you and start beating up the devil. But the problem was, when they beat the devil, they were really beating you. And you were the one getting the whack. Come out, come out. They whacking you. Come out, come out. But they were like aggressive. Am I right? They were hard. They were coming at that devil. No, how dare you? How dare you come and tempt my child, my son, spiritual son, spiritual daughter? How dare you tempt the people of God? And they were like aggressive, man. And when they got done with you, you were tired. <laughs> there was no strength left in your body for the devil to live in. He was tired. But, they, but they, were, they, were, they were aggressive. You know what I'm talking about? They were aggressive. See, we went to the same church. They were aggressive. And today, you can come in this church with a miniskirt on. I've seen them come to the altar. I had to go and preach to the other side. They come up to the altar to get saved in miniskirts. I had to go minister to the people on the other side. They come up and I say, ain't nobody aggressive. Ain't nobody else. Oh, come on. Just have a seat on the front row. And, uh, you know, but. Uh, but just, it's, it's we, we've, we've lost the fire. And we've lost the spirit of fighting back. We aren't the fighters that we used to be. And that's why, you know, the enemy is doing so much more because he's not meeting any resistance. And if he is meeting resistance, it's passive. And he knows that if he just keeps coming at you, you're going to get tired because there ain't really no fight in you and that you'll quit believing God to receive the promise. See, and you know, 
you don't have anyone to blame. It's just the nature of our generation. Everything comes easy for us now. Now, some of y'all say, it ain't going to go easy for me. My life is hard. My life, no, I can take you some places where life is hard. You ain't seen hard if you're living in the United States. You have not. I can take you to some places where life is hard, where they still lighting candles. That's their lights at night, and they don't have floors. They got they own hard dirt floors. I can take you. I've been there. I've been in those places. And so, you know, we, we got it made. You know, a lot of it, you know, particularly the men don't have that same drive anymore because, see, back in, in, in ancient history, if you didn't hunt, you didn't eat. <laughs> so you better have some fire in you because if you don't, you're going to starve. And you didn't have a gun. You had to have a spear and something. I mean, you know, then you transition the gun thing, but you had to go out. There had to be something inside of you, you understand, a nature inside of you that made you want to go out and survive. But see, today... We go to the drive through window. We don't even have to get out the car. We don't even have to get out the car to eat. We go through the drive. You used to have to get out the car and go in and place your order. Now you just drive through. I want double, uh, give me a double quarter pounder with cheese, slap a little extra onion on that, supersize them fries with a Diet Coke, please. Because I'm watching... <laughs> and it's easy it's easy sometimes I kid my wife when I got to go to the store and get something I say, I'm going hunting all I'm doing is going up to a shelf and, I, and then I had a nerve to get frustrated when I can't find it right away it's gotten pretty soft Life has gotten kind of easy. And it's taken the fight that we really need out of us. Because if you never reach a point in your life where you will not take something anymore. And I'm talking about transitioning beyond saying, I can't take this. No, no. See, there's a difference between saying, I can't take something, to saying, I will not take this anymore. Until you get to that place, then you won't fight. Are you hearing me? Now, I'm going to take a couple of minutes, go through a couple of scriptures. Some of them are repeats from War Sunday, but I just want to reinforce uh, who you're up against so that that it stirs up the flame in, in your spirit to come harder than you've been coming against him. See, the devil is confrontational. You believe that? Yes. Genesis 3 and 1, it sounds really innocent, but it's, it's confrontational. Genesis 3 and 1, it says, uh, it says, now the serpent was crafty, more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat? from any tree in the garden. Luke twenty two thirty one. Luke twenty two thirty one. Simon, Simon, this is Jesus talking. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I pray for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. First Peter five and eight. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Verse 9 says, resist him. Resist him. Everyone say resist him. <laughs> resist him. Standing firm in what? In the faith. Because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. Why do I have you read those three scriptures? I had you read those three scriptures because it makes a point. Here's the point it makes. Eve, there's no, no place in the Bible where it says Eve invited the devil to come and talk to her. Some of y'all got it. Some of y'all looking at me like, and? <laughs> My point is, she was minding her own business. 
She wasn't entertaining him, wasn't uh, talking to him. What does he do? Uninvited. Uninvited. He crashes the party. That's who you're dealing with. He comes to crash your party. You're, you're healthy, feeling good, and then he comes to crash your party with sickness and disease. You going to work and feeling good, then you come the next day and they say, we're laying you off. He comes to crash your party. Come to crash it. Then Jesus tells Peter, he said, hey man, <laughs> I got to tell you something. Uh, your devil came, came and uh, uh, he was talking about, you know, asking us, could we give him permission to mess you up, Peter? Now, Peter's minding his own business. Peter hasn't said anything about the devil, any negative words. He hasn't said anything about the devil. He ain't bring the devil up. But the devil's bringing him up. And then Peter gives us the revelation over there. And he says, you, here's what you need to know about that dude. He's prowling around looking. Looking for someone to mess with. Just looking for somebody. He's aggressive. Confrontational. Now, let me show you something else. Go to Revelation. Just, just, I'm dealing with the devil and I'm, we're going to move on a little bit. You with me this morning? Yes. Say, I must be aggressive with my faith. I, I have an enemy who's very confrontational, who is very aggressive, very aggressive. and I got to meet aggression with aggression. Yes. Amen. 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 Now, Revelation 20, be good if I turn there, wouldn't it? I have not committed these verses to memory. And uh, verse 1, I'm going to show you the devil, all right? I'm going to show you this dude. It says, uh, and I, verse 1, I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Ain't that something? This is dealing with the, the millennial period. This takes place after the seven-year tribulation. Uh, Satan is taken captive and thrown in a pit for a thousand years. And for 1,000 years on the earth, during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ on the earth, for 1,000 years there is nothing but peace and no trouble. Are y'all hearing this? Can you imagine life with just peace and no trouble? I mean everybody just happy. Why is everybody happy? Why is there peace? Why is there no trouble? Because the devil is in prison. He's locked up for a thousand years. Which says to us, he must be the source of trouble. Because if there's nothing but peace when he's out the picture, then he must be the reason for hell in the picture. So now, so he gets locked up and he gets thrown into this pit, right? And it says, uh, they kept him, it says, threw him, verse 2, into the abyss, locked and sealed it over him uh, to keep him for, from deceiving the nations anymore till the thousand years were ended. And then after that, he must be set free for a short time. You got it? Now go down to verse 7. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison, and he will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. Now, if you were locked up, you just did a thousand years time, you done a thousand years, wouldn't you think if they ever let me out of this place, I, I promise, I will straighten up and I won't do nothing else wrong because I just did a thousand years in prison. This dude as soon as they let him go, he has not been rehabilitated. He must not took no shop classes or GED courses. Because he's been locked up and he ain't changed. In fact, seems like he's gotten a little worse. His attitude's gotten a little worse. So he comes out of there 
It goes the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number, they're like sand on the seashore. The people that he was able to, to deceive and follow him, they became as numerous as the sand on the seashores in a very short period of time. He was that deceitful. And they marched across the breadth of the earth. And look at this. Let's see where Satan and his, and his armies headed. And surrounded the camp of who? God's people. The city he loves. You see that? So this is the devil. You ain't going to change him. You are not going to rehabilitate him. You are not going to reason with him. You are not going to cause him to show you any mercy. You are not going to cause him to give you a break. He is who he is, and he's going to always be that way. Even when they throw him in the lake of fire, he probably still going to be cursing. He is not going to change. Now, all of the, the, this that we have read about him, if this is how he is, then we better get as tough and aggressive as him. And <laughs> we got to get as tough and aggressive as him. Yeah, you ready to really do some damage, sure, I tell you. I'm addressing our spiritual attitude. Too passive. Not really fighters. Hold me in church too long. I'm going to do, we used to call it the Kojic dip. I ain't never figured out why they ducked. I mean, everybody see you. Just stand up and walk out. Don't be. You, you preach for an hour. I'm telling you, preacher. But then we get attacked, and then we start saying, I prayed, why ain't it working? Why ain't it working? There ain't no fire in your belly. You haven't developed an intolerance. You're too passive. Got to get more aggressive. You know, if snow can keep you home from church, yeah, it ain't even plowing inches. It's just a dusting. Some people open up their curtain this morning, shut it back, and rolled over in the bed and said, I can't go. It's snowing. But, but, then, but then when your money gets attacked, Why, why isn't it working? Because you ain't got no fire in your belly to get your money back. Amen. All I got to do is snow and you stay home. How are you going to get millions in, from the kingdom? How are you going to do that? And it's, and, and it's March Madness too? And first service is too early. You can forget that. But certainly ain't going to second service because I'll miss a game. But you ain't going to care who dumped if you get hit with this dude who after a thousand years, he's just as ruthless as he was before you put him in. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, you got to get your fire back. That was all right. That was all right. That was, that was, that was better. Y'all did better than first service. You know, some of the first over there, they're sophisticated. You better get your fire back. <laughs> <laughs> they like to pronounce it, fire back. <laughs> Let me hit my 11, my 1130. Say, so you better get your fire back. 
Oh, yeah. See, y'all got some gangster in you here at 11.30. Yeah, y'all rolling at 11.30. <laughs> but that's what's going to be required. See, we've been given this gift of faith, but the purpose of this gift is for your fight of faith. You, it is the fight of faith. And you've got to get to a place where you won't say no. You won't give up. You won't give up. You won't quit. The wind starts blowing, you get like Jesus, and you stand in the face of the wind. You stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with it and say, get out of here. In the name of Jesus. I've, I've been, over, we've been, we've ministered over in, in Nigeria a few times. And uh, they, they, uh, one setting, we were at an outside meeting. Now, here, here's the thing. The people walk five to ten miles to get to the meeting. And then when they get there, ain't no chairs. T feel the cushion on your seat. Just rub it right now. See, that's why y'all ain't got no fire in you right now. We need some steel chairs up in here. And <laughs> And, uh, so no chairs. Look, I'm, I'm serious. Five to ten miles, they walk to the meeting. Get there, there's no chairs. And they stand the whole service. And the service is three to four hours. Three to four hours. And they don't leave. They stand there and they don't leave because they're hungry for a move of God. They want God to move in their life. And so I'll never forget the first time we went, the platform had a, a metal floor, metal floor on the platform. And, uh, you know, you couldn't call everybody up because it's like 5,000 people there, and, and they would all just come. We made the mistake. It was, was it my fault? It was my fault. I did that. <laughs> was that me? I didn't even preach. You preached. I never... <laughs> So she's preaching on faith, and, uh, you know, God said, I'm going to move and manifest, minister to the people. That's what he told me. So I told her, I said, Lord said, minister to the people. We asked the pastor, could we minister to the people? He said, yes. Well, you know how you, you call for prayer line here. You know, maybe 10% of the people come up for prayer. The whole 5,000. They all just whoosh. And I'm looking at her like, why'd you ask all these people to come up for prayer? <laughs> but anyway, but <laughs> moving on. But we saw miracles that night. We saw a man who had not moved his arm since like 1954. He was in an auto accident. And he was bringing his grandson up for prayer who uh, was in an accident and couldn't, couldn't move his hand and grip. So he, he pushes his grandson through the crowd to grab my shirt. And uh, the boy was not able to grab anything. The boy reached through the crowd, got to my shirt in his hand, grabbed it instantly. Then the granddaddy, who hadn't moved, his, lifted his arm since 1954, I lay hands on the man. He picks the arm up immediately. See, they had a move of God. A move of God. Because they were hungry for it. Anyway, let me get back to, to the original. So I'm talking about how we got soft. That was where I was really at, though. So you got this metal floor. It's our first time over there. Outside, bugs all over everywhere. Metal floor. And so the people, they started calling people up to lay hands on them, but they didn't call everybody. They were calling on certain conditions. Metal floor. So y'all know how here we have catchers and carpet. It better be the Holy Ghost. If you fall out, it better be the Holy Ghost. Because I turned one way, and I heard this, blam! I'm turning. <laughs> I said, these folks don't play. They are rough. And I mean, they, blam, hitting the ground and getting up and shaking it off and walking away. Ain't thinking about no lawsuits. Just walking away. Thanking God for the healing. In the name of Jesus, just hard, just hard. And over here we say, lift your hands so we can pray for you. Uh -oh. 
And some people, you even say, lift your hands, and they just like. <laughs> Where is the fire? You know, we got so far over in the counseling ministry. Yeah, I got to go there. We want to counsel out a demon. You ain't counseling no demon out. A demon knows how to shut up and start talking like they're perfectly healed and delivered. And Yes, I receive. You feel better, brother? Yes, I feel so much better. That demon said, tell him you feel better. Yes, I feel so much better. In a counseling session, they ain't going to be manifesting. Arr, they ain't going to be doing it in no counseling session, but you get them up in a deliverance service where somebody said, come out of that. We had a guy come to our church. This was early days of the ministry. A woman showed up. You know, I had just gotten off my job and uh, full-time in ministry, and I'm in my office. And uh, it was pretty boring. You know, I used to go down, it was pretty boring. And I'm like, what in the world am I going to do? I'm used to like 10, 12-hour days busy and all that. And what in the world am I going to do? Well, anyway, sitting there one day in the office, get a call from the secretary. Pastor, there's some people here who want to see you. Then he called my wife. And then we, uh, so we said, well, who is it? Well, I don't really know their name. I'm like, then why the heck you let them in? What I'm thinking, why you let them in? And uh, so we go there. My wife and I get there, and there's this couple, man and woman, and she, uh, she speaks for the man. She said, um, he's a part of a witch's coven, and he wants to get out of it, but they won't let him out. And uh, we were just driving down the street and decided to bring him here. They told him, man, he couldn't get out. The witcher says, you cannot get out. And you know what that meant. They just keep, you know, speaking that stuff over him and keep controlling his spirit. Told him he couldn't get out. So, you know, we couldn't be a punk. <laughs> Although I felt like being one. <laughs> I felt like saying... Well, I, how do you know it was God told you to come here? You know, we, I ain't heard him tell me to tell you. That's what I wanted to tell him. But in my spirit, I knew that that man needed to be delivered. We knew. And in the spirit, we knew we had to cast the devil out of that man. And if he's bold enough to step up in our church, then we got to minister to this man. And we started ministering and commanding the devil to come out of that man. And we weren't up there trying to counsel no demons. No, we were standing in the name that we were singing about during praise and worship, in the name of Jesus. And commanding that demon to come out of that man. Pretty soon that man started contorting and fell to the ground and was slithering on the floor like a snake. And his tongue was slithering in and out of his mouth. And we just kept commanding that demon to leave that man in Jesus' name. And all of a sudden, he's writhing, slithering tongue. All of a sudden, he went limp. Completely limp. And then he started opening his mouth. And the only word out of his mouth was shalom. Shalom, shalom, peace, peace, peace. But my point is, what if that demon hadn't been confronted? That man would have left the same way he came. God is calling for us. There, there, is, there is a warrior side of Jesus. You hear me? 
I know he's the lamb of God. I know he's the lamb. I know it. He's the lamb in the I know that side of him. I know that side of him. But guess what? There's another side called the lion of Judah. So what's your point, Dr. C? Christ lives in you now. Amen. And there is a lion. There's a lamb in you, but there's also, there's a lion in you. There's a lion in you that you've got to allow to come up out of you. You hear me? you got to allow it. At some point, you got to transition from training to fighting. You with me? A boxer goes through a season when he's going to fight an opponent. He goes through a season of what? Training. Training. And it's intense. And the purpose of it is for him to prepare for the fight. Now, here's the thing. But here's my point here. Just because you're training, you know, don't assume that because you're training that you're ready to fight. But at some point, now here's where I'm headed with this, at some point you got to come out of training. Amen. At some point, you got to discover what's really in you. And you know, I was the type of person coming up, I ain't like no fighting. I was a lover, not a fighter. I ain't like fighting. I didn't. You know, but if you, if you push me, I only had a few fights, but if you push me, I don't want to fight. You know, I'd rather not. Uh, and, um, uh, but if you push me, then, then I'd have to. And then I pray I had the strength of the Lord in me <laughs> to lay hands on people suddenly. And, uh, but, um, um, I said this in faith and healing. It's true. Because I grew up in a real strict Pentecostal church, we weren't able to participate in any sports at our church. And I really wish, cause I wasn't a fighter, but I really wished I would have played like football or wrestle or something because those types of things bring up you know some some aggressive competitiveness inside of you you understand what I'm saying and I wish I had had it but I didn't but my point is so if I was pushed to fight I would but some of y'all don't even if you push you won't and the devil is a pusher and you got to push back at some point you got to come out the ring you will not be crowned champion until you fight. I don't care how good you train. I don't care how well you train. You will not be given the belt until after you fight. And here's what the Holy Spirit said to me years ago. He says, you've got to, you've got to fight and win enough battles to reach a place in your spiritual life where you know you can't lose. See, and that don't always come through the first fight. You know, Tyson got to a point in his day, Tyson got to a point like before he even got in the ring. Hey, nobody's going to beat me. Nobody's going to beat me. I'm going to knock him out. I'm gonna, and if I can't knock him out, I'll bite his ear off. But I'll do something. I'm going to win. I'm going to win. But he got to a place after he had won so many fights, he got to a point where he believed that he was invincible, that nothing, nobody that stepped in the ring with him could win. We got to get to that point in our spiritual lives. We got to reach that place in our spirit, man. That means we're going to have to quit. <laughs> we're going to have to quit whining, and we got to get out there. The devil shows up. All right, you here, I'm here. I'm not running. I'm not avoiding. No, we're going to deal with this. I will not tolerate it. In fact, anything that you are bringing to me is incompatible with my spirit. It doesn't mix with what God said I'm supposed to have in my life. And I will not allow it. 
And you got to win enough. Tell your neighbor, you got to win enough fights before your faith rises to a level where you really believe you're invincible. I ain't got there yet. Y'all wasn't supposed to clap because I said I ain't got there. I'm messing with you. You can clap. I know y'all clap something. I got I got to, I got to, I got to get in there and win a few more. Y'all hear me? Yeah. Got to get in there and got to fight it. Got to be a faith fight, which means that I'm going to stand on the word of God for this one. Amen. Now I'm going to give you my testimony. Read one scripture and I'm out today. I'll never forget. Uh, this was many years ago. Uh, uh, I think it was it. Yeah, we, were we pastoring at that time? I think we were. All right. So I'm sitting at home in the evening, and I'm looking at TV. Now, don't start getting on me because I look at TV. Some of y'all say, I know y'all religious folks. You should have been in your word. You should have been in your word. What you doing watching TV? You the pastor. You were supposed to have a TV in your house. Well, anyhow, I'm watching TV, and uh, sitting on the couch. No problem. As soon as I get up, a severe pain hits my back. And uh, it knocked me to my knees. Couldn't walk. Now, I ain't doing nothing. I ain't working out, stretching, exercising. I'm just sitting on my couch. Looking at TV. But there's no reason for my back to be in this condition. I'm down on my knees and I'm in severe pain. I mean, I am in tremendous pain. I ain't never felt pain like that. So I go down. And uh, I'm like, wow. And something inside of me said, don't take it. Don't take this. And, uh, you know, when you're hurting real bad, your body and your mind are saying, we need to go, you know, to the emergency room, let them shoot something in there to get, to get rid of that pain. But if for some reason... For this one, the Holy Spirit said, don't, don't take it. Don't take this. It's from the devil. And I knew it. I said, this is from the devil. I've done nothing. Shouldn't happen. John made a decision. I'm not taking it. I'm on the ground. I can't walk. I eventually managed to crawl my way up. But before I get up, I just start speaking the word of God. And I said, Lord, your word says by your stripes, I was healed. So I just started speaking that as I'm on the ground. I just start speaking it. I'm healed in the name of Jesus. I'm not saying my back hurts. I'm not saying I can't walk. I'm saying by your stripes, I was healed. And I just kept speaking it. And I kept saying it, but I still couldn't walk, couldn't walk, but I'm speaking it. What am I doing? Confronting it. I'm confronting it. Don't look like I'm winning, but I'm confronting it. Finally, I got to a point where I could get up, and I could barely take steps. And each step I took just racked with pain. But I just started doing what I could. By stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. And I just walked and just kept quoting that scripture till about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm just walking and quoting. And every step is agonizing. I got tired. And I said, well, I'm going to go lay down. I went to bed, laid down in pain. And uh, as I'm laying there, the devil is saying, you know, you know you can't go to work. You know you can't go to work. And I opened my mouth and I said, I'll be at work tomorrow. I'll be at work tomorrow. By the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. By the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. What am I doing? Confronting. Confronting. He's, he's hitting me. I'm hitting back. So I lay down. The next morning, I can't move. <laughs> it's like 6 in the morning, and I can't move. I look over to my wife. And I tell my wife, I said, roll me out of the bed. She said, sure. <laughs> ah! <laughs> she 
she, <laughs> she pushed me like you ain't no punk. <laughs> she pushed me, but we're laughing. But see, she's my faith partner. My wife is my faith partner. She knows that we got to be in agreement for this thing. And if she sees that my faith is saying, roll me out of here, she's not going to say, no, you don't look like you're in any condition to do it. She said, uh-uh, if that's where your faith is, that's where my faith is. And she rolled me out. Rolled out the bed, flat on my face. <laughs> Took me about a half hour to crawl up. Took me about a half hour. I crawl up. I ain't take no shower. I said, bump the shower. <laughs> and anyone who may be offended by my body odor today, I'll give it a double shot if I have to, but no shower today. We doing good just getting up out of here today, today. And, uh, and I get my clothes on. I kind of hobble out to my car. I'm at work on time. I work all day, the entire, I did not go home early. I worked the whole day. As I go through the day, I'm saying, by stripes, I am healed. The devil is saying, you're going to have to go home. By stripes, I am healed. Made it through the day. And what happened was as the day progressed, the symptoms began to subside. Went home, I still was in pain. But I was better than I was when I got up earlier. And I just kept speaking the word. Why did I share that testimony? I had to confront that spirit. It was a valuable faith lesson. Do you hear me? For me. And it set something in my spirit at that time. And I heard the Holy Spirit said, never let the devil set your agenda or your schedule. Never let him control your schedule. I've seen people quit because they had pain. Leave things because it was uncomfortable. Walked away because it challenged them a little bit. And what they didn't know is if they just stuck it out another day, if they'd have just hung in there for another day or maybe another week, on the other side of that thing, God had something great. But because you let it go and you let the devil push you and cause you to back up, you miss a God opportunity to do something great in your life. We got to get aggressive. The enemy's attacks are intensifying. He knows that his time is short. Y'all better hear this. He knows that his time is short. And the closer it gets to his end, the more violent and aggressive and assertive he's going to be. And see, and like it or not, God saved us to be this generation on the earth for this time. And I'm here to tell you, we would not be on this earth today if God hadn't placed in us the spirit that we needed to overcome the devil. It's in us. In us. Say, I got a lion in me. I'm going to close here. And if you're happy that the sermon is, somebody, if, you, if you buy sermon, if you bought the sermon line, I'm scared, I'm scared of you already. But if you're happy that I'm coming to the end, say amen. Nah. I say, I, I, I linger too long. I would have got somebody. Here's why you must be aggressive, and we're going to end in Deuteronomy 9, verse one will begin. I'm going to show you this spiritual principle. We're going to go. Did you learn something? Yeah. Yeah. Deuteronomy 9 and 1. You all know that uh, over in Exodus, God had promised that he was going to take the children of Israel into a land that he was going to give them. He said, I'm going to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, right? And, uh, and so the children of Israel, you know, they're operating under this assumption 
that God has given us the land. And so all we have to do is just walk in it because God has what? Given it to us. But now look at Deuteronomy 9. God is preparing them to go into the land that he's giving them. And here's what he says. He says, Hear, O Israel, you are now about to cross the Jordan to go in and what? Dispossess, dispossess, dispossess. Do you all know what that word means? That's a, that word is something. So God is, wait a minute. Now, time out. You said you were giving me the land. Now you're telling me I have to dispossess. Dispossess means somebody's on the land, on my land, that God has given me. Somebody's on it. And if I am going to possess it, then I'm going to have to dispossess who is on it. But wait a minute, now something ain't adding up here. You said, God, that you were giving me the land. So I'm supposed to, if you're giving me the land, then I'm supposed to just, thank you. Holy, I thank my land. Oh, it's all mine. See, look, look, look. And I know y'all be looking at me like that. Straight. 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 You see my point? God gave it to them, but he said, you got to take it. Ah. It's yours. But you got to get whoever's on it out. You have to. Okay, now. Then it wasn't bad enough God told them they had to dispossess. The word dispossess means to seize, to rob, to expel, to ruin, to impoverish, to cast out, and destroy. That's what it means. So it wasn't bad enough God told them he had to dispossess them. Then God rubs it in. He says, now you got to go and dispossess nations that are greater and stronger than you with large cities that have walls up to the sky the people are this is quite a pep rally the people are strong this is supposed to be a pep rally to pump me up to go and get get my land and you telling me that I'm coming up against people stronger than me and they got walls and all that stuff now wait a minute wait a minute then God didn't stop there he said by the way he said you know the Anakites are over there Anak and his cousins are there he said, and you know about them, and have heard it said, who can stand up against the Anakites? Well, now, how am I supposed to get pumped up to get my land when you're telling me that the opposition is greater than my physical ability and strength? God says, I ain't done yet. He says, here's the deal. Be assured, verse 3 today, that the Lord your God is the one who goes across ahead of you like a devouring fire. He will, he will destroy them. He will subdue them before you. And you will drive them out and annihilate them quickly as the Lord has promised. All right, now, I'm standing to your feet because we're going we're gonna to head out of here. Here's what the scripture is saying. God has given you a promise. Healing is yours. Prosperity is yours. Peace is yours. A blessed marriage is yours. A blessed family is yours. It's all yours. God has given it to you. However, you got to go and dispossess. Whatever is standing in your life that goes against the promise, you got to confront it. Now, here's the good news. 
Even though what you're facing may appear to be overwhelming, God says, if you take a step forward, I'm going to go before you. Every step you take, rest assured, I will be ahead of you. Now, if you stand in one spot, I go no further than this spot. But if you move forward, I will move forward. If you take another step, I'm going to be ahead of you. And if you decide you're going all the way, I'm going all the way. And when I go, I'm going to be a fire consuming the works of the enemy against you. Come on, say, I got to be aggressive. Say, I got to move forward. And say, and I must dispossess the devil. Say, God's going to go before me, but I'm moving forward. Come on and praise God. Get your fire back. 